Um, so as Mark uh, said, this, what I'd like to present today is about the transition of capitalism in the Scottish Highlands and what this means for the agroecology and food sovereignty movements. And I'm presenting a, a sliver of, of my wider PhD dissertation, which covered um, the food systems from the clanship era through to today. Um, but for, for this morning's presentation, I'll, I'll just cover that transition from clanship to, capital, to capitalism. Um, before I get too far into it, I just want to uh, be clear about what I mean by the highlands. So in my PhD, I, I talk about the uplands, but for this, we're talking about the highlands, which um, on the map, in the map on the right, there's a red line, which roughly delineates uh, what's called the highland line, which um, sort of follows the highland fault line. Um, the highlands and the lowlands were never a extremely firm um, distinction, but but there are. It, it was kind of a, a, a broad categorization between highlands and lowlands. And on the right hand side, you can see um, the areas in green are actually considered classified as less favoured areas in the Common Agricultural Policy of the EU. And so you can see there's quite a lot of. Um, correspondence between the highlands and the less favoured areas um, above the fault line and then below the fault line we have the southern uplands. Um, so in the uplands of Scotland, so the uplands tend to be defined as um, as basically areas where, where sheep are farmed or livestock is farmed. So uh, in 1988 the uplands were defined as areas above the upper limits of cultivated farmland implying that the only agriculture feasible in the uplands was, was livestock. Um, uh, the hills in the upland areas have also been distinguished as the hill areas are the areas for breeding store lambs and the upland areas are for um, breeding and fattening store lambs. Um, and the uplands are used interchangeably with the less favoured areas um, of the common agricultural policy in Scotland. And less favoured area payments in Scotland tend to be based on the premise that continued livestock farming protects the cultural heritage and semi-natural semi -natural habitats of the uplands. Mm -hmm. um, there have recently, however, been some contestations around the predominance of sheep in the uplands. And if you're uh, familiar with the rewilding movement, or you may have read uh, George Monbiot's Feral, uh, book, you'll know that she, <laughs> the rewilders can sometimes um, frame sheep as evil <laughs> creatures um, and very anti-ecological and um, advocate for the introduction of predators to basically control the sheep populations and allow for ecological succession. Um, so there's been campaigns for reintroducing wolves and lynxes, um, beavers and, and other animals. Um, and then another area which has been uh, contesting the predominance of livestock has been forestry. So forestry um, in the uplands really took off after the Second World War. Um, more recently, forestry has been pitched as an ecological activity because of carbon sequestration. Um, however, in terms of actual ecology, the forestry uh, tends to be done in plantations with um, nearly all the same species of tree, which um, is a non-native species, typically Sitka spruce from Alaska. And it's uh, all the trees are planted at the same age and they're clear felled. So in terms of ecological habitat, it's not very rich. And for me, as someone who's interested in food, um, my concern is, is how... Is, is how um, how agriculture has become disoriented from the dietary needs of the population. So at present, the vast majority of land in Scotland is oriented towards livestock. So 5 million hectares is for grazing and another um, 7 million hectares is dedicated to the production of animal feed. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So I think if someone's not muted, you might want to mute. Um, most of that livestock is consumed either in England or it's is exported to Europe. Um, a minority of livestock products are consumed by um, people in Scotland, um, but it's typically aimed at the, quote, discerning consumers and, and sold at a price premium, so it's not accessible to everyone. 
And the remainder of arable land is used for, um, dedicated for barley for distillation, uh, for the production of biscuits or the production of biofuels. Um, so only le one, less than 1% of agricultural land in Scotland is actually dedicated to vegetable and fruit production. And sadly, a lot of the fruit is, is exported because it's high value um, berries. So Scotland imports the vast majority of its food and as one, um, one uh, expert in food policy, Tim Lang, summarised, uh, he was talking about Britain as a whole. He said, Britain imports good things for public health and exports death. So he's talking about um, red meat, whiskey and, and biscuits. Um, and in, so for me, this begs the question of where does our food actually come from? And... Um, in the top left photo, you have the kind of depiction of some small holders in Sub-Saharan Africa, or maybe in the Caribbean. Um, and there's a story that uh, by us ex uh, importing food from these from these small holders, we're helping provide them with with livelihoods and improved incomes. And I um, I was a believer in that story, and I used to work with small holders to try to um, link them to higher value markets. And then I worked in a um, an incidence of famine and food insecurity, and I witnessed people starving about 30 miles from where people were exporting French beans to the UK. And it really started to unravel this narrative for me and make me question where food comes from and, and, and the flow of resources embodied in food, the flow of of ecological and, and also social resources that are sent from one part of the globe to another. The, the next photo down is, is a depiction of one of the plastic deserts in Spain, um, I believe it's from Almeria, where we import a lot of our fresh fruit and vegetables in the UK. Um, obviously not a very ecological use of land. And then the photo on the right is a depiction of um, one of the kind of industrial monocultures that uh, is very prevalent in our society at the moment. So where farmers go for economies of scale and um, they tend to favor uniformity and with, with that they have to use um, inorganic fertilizers and, and um, soluble nitrates, uh, which has very negative impacts on our water supply and also um, uh, climate change impacts. They also tend to rely on, on pesticides, uh, fungicides and herbicides, uh, which have a whole host of negative biological impacts. And um, in general, the, the system of farming is not very resilient to shocks. Um, so I would say even on its own terms, it might not be very successful. And so, um, so we have these, these problematic areas where our food comes from, and yet I also found these amazing outliers of farms in the Scottish uplands, um, which were practicing basically what we would probably consider to be agroecology. So they were producing a variety of foods, um, fruits and vegetables, integrating animals. Um, so they might have kept a few, uh, a few cattle and sheep, but also ducks and chickens. And um, these were these were farms that were actually existing in what would what would be considered to be the the highlands or the uplands where again people have have perceived that only sheep is possible so these outliers kind of gave me the sense that actually um there are other ways that, that agriculture can be practiced in the uplands so so some of my research questions I'd like to talk to you today about, um, I wanted to know what the political and e ecological dynamics were historically, which helped to shape today's food systems in the Scottish uplands. And then what that tells us about the ecological potentials for the uplands to better contribute to agroecological food systems. And also what that can tell us about the agroecology and food sovereignty movements more, more generally, more globally. Um, so first, what I haven't done yet is talked much about what I mean by agroecology, and, and this is a bit of a big topic in itself. So at the farm level, agroecology can generally encompass a, a few basic principles. So one is nutrient and en energy cycling on farms and minimizing external inputs. So the top left photo is a um, depiction of you know, compost where you're, you're 
composting the the crop residue and, and waste on on your farm and um, that can also be a good way to do the second principle of enhancing soil matter and soil biological activity so building up soils rather than depleting them and then also diversifying plant species and genetic resources so um we have the the top right photo is um uh, a good example of a, a large amount of diversity on a, on a small um, space of land. The bottom left photo is also a good example of diversity. That's um, a population of wheat. So often conventional farms would, would only plant one variety of wheat at a time. Um, and here, uh, this is a photo from Martin Wolf, the late Professor Martin Wolf. He, he planted a population of 200 varieties of wheat, um, which is, is really great for resilient because really resilience because some will be resistant to rust and some drought and some damp. Um, so, so that's another way of cultivating diversity. And then the other aspect is optimizing interactions between elements of the farming system rather than trying to maximize yields of an individual species. So we see this with mixed farming where livestock is integrated with uh, arable cropping. We can also see this um, in the classic example of the three sisters where you have corn, bean and squash and um, the beans provide nitrogen for the squash and the corn and the corn is great for the, the beans to grow up and the squash is really good for covering the soil. Um, so these are kind of the typical principles at a farm level of what agroecology means. Um, more recently, there's been um, movements to go beyond the farm scale and think about food systems um, and more of a political approach to agroecology that goes beyond these technical, these techniques on farms to actually think about the food systems overall. Um, and some of the framings of political agroecology advocates are um, against the industrial food system, against the green revolution, and some of them have been framed as, as anti-capitalist. Amongst the framings of um, the anti-capitalist movements, there's generally um, a focus on the means of production, but there's also a perception that capitalism is driven by corporates, by agribusiness, and by globalization or interna internationalization. Um, and I think that there needs to be a bit more clarity about what we mean by capitalism in order for us to be more clearly anti-capitalist. Um, Agroecology was recently incorporated into the aims of the food sovereignty movement, uh, which is largely led by La Via Campesina. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And this quote, I think, is from the Nialini de Declaration, and it says, food sovereignty aims to return the land to its social function as the producer of food and sustainer of life. So uh, La Via Campesina is considered one of the most influential transnational movements to exist, um, but it's also been considered as big tent politics, which has its um, positives and negatives. So um, it enables the grouping together of, of lots of different voices, but it can also mean that there's multiple inter interpretations of food sovereignty and some conflicting class interests which are advocated under the same banner. Um, food sovereignty was initially associated with peasants, but there's been some shifts towards, um, towards food sovereignty being about people, so producers and consumers. And food sovereignty isn't uh, is not about self-sufficiency. Um, there's there's a local focus, but the food sovereignty movement generally acknowledges that trade um, is not necessarily a negative thing, but it should be based on principles. Um, so in terms of what I've identified as the counter-capitalist aspects of the food sovereignty movement, um, one of them is democratizing rather than privatizing resources. And I've got there a quote um, that human beings having direct democratic control over how we use and maintain the land, water and other resources around us for the benefit of future and current generations. Obviously not quite how we organize ourselves now. Um, it's, it's generally advocating reorienting towards food rather than commodities. It rejects the proposition that food is, is simply a commodity and it wants 
markets, it's not advocating for everyone to be a self-sufficient producer, but for markets to be under societal control. And it also advocates for the democratization of trade. Again, so trade is okay, but the, it, the La Vie Campesina stance is that decisions about trade need to be determined through democratic deliberation and not market forces. Now, um, the food sovereignty movement has raised um, a number of debates about peasantness. Obviously, there have been debates about peasantness for, for quite a long time, and um, with numbers, a number of scholars uh, having perspectives on this. Uh, broadly, I would say um, van der Plerk has, has been a prominent voice in the food sovereignty and agroecology literature. And he advocates that peasants are associated with ecological production and food sovereignty. And he defines peasants as people who strive to reduce their dependency on input markets, and they don't employ or commodify wage labor or try not to do so. So basically they try to have control over their, um, their means of production. And he considers peasants to be petty commodity producers uh, who produce cultural foods with provenance and distinction. So one of the examples he gives is of Parmesan from, from Italy. Um, Van der Plerg and Bernstein, Bernstein have been kind of head to head on this topic. And um, Henry Bernstein, um, he argues that petty commodity producers have internalized commodity relations and are engaged in relentless microcapitalism. And he's largely dismissed the food sovereignty movement. Um, I would say that uh, the polarization between van der Plerg's kind of neo chinovian approach and Bernstein's orthodox Marxist approach, um, you know, there, there's there's another way. And the way that I've um, chosen to look at things is, is market dependence. So I've, I've really resonated with Alan Wood's definition of capitalism as market dependency for social reproduction. So she identifies this as when people engage with markets as a compulsion rather than engaging with markets as an opportunity. And she sees this as, um, so this, this represents going beyond just considering the means of production and whether that's commodified to consider how people um, engage in, in um, selling into markets with, with their outputs. So he, she considers that when people sell, even when prices are falling, that's a sign. And also when people are competing, even when prices are high and demand is high, is a sign of, of market dependency. Um, market dependency in agricultural terms, my understanding is that it changes not only um, how production is done, but also what's produced. So in my understanding, when people are market dependent, the exchange value of a good is prioritized over its societal use value. So I would say that the production of niche foods, which van der Plerk, um, thinks are fantastic with, uh, you know, foods of distinction, this for me is, is problematic because these niche foods tend to be um, exclusive, so they're not available to all classes. And they also tend to be discretionary foods. So discretionary foods are foods that we don't need to actually survive um, for a good, healthy diet. Um, and then Mark Tilsey, who introduced me, he has also argued that um, these niche markets, they only provide temporary relief from the pressures of competition. And so they're not actually really a solution. Um, and also when people are market dependent, they might, um, they, the competition might result in downward pressure um, so that they might compromise um, their ecological uh, processes. So they'll either try to reduce labor or go for economies at scale to, to increase their profit levels. So my understanding is that market dependence results in a divergence from agroecological food systems. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll go on from there. <laughs> um, there's been a number of debates about um, whether agroecology can feed the world. Um, some people who advocate for agroecology say that the agroecological yields are comparable to or higher than conventional um, agricultural yields. Um, other people say that the agroecological agri food has a higher nutritional content, whether it's micronutrients or better omega profiles. 
um, but crop diversity contributes to better dietary diversity, and it's also more resilient to climate shocks. Um, but other studies have indicated that organic yields are lower than conventional yields, and people who advocate for the need to feed the 9 billion, they indicate that there's a need to dramatically increase yields in order to do so. Um, my stance on yields is that there are real difficulties in comparing agroecological and conventional approaches um, because of rotations, because of that inherent built-in diversity, um, because of the increased labour demands. And at the moment, we haven't had a really good long-term study which compares conventional agroecological agri yields. Um, I think the, the argument for needing to ramp up production to feed the 9 billion are, are problematic because they're based on modeling of price dynamics to determine access to food. So they're not actually based on um, the food availability, but more on um, accessibility within a capitalist system. They also assume that diets are going to become more westernized in non-Western places and will continue as the same uh, in the West, and we all know that Western diet isn't particularly good for public health. Um, and then there's also this issue that producing more food doesn't address distribution and access issues. So we have 800 million people hungry at the moment, despite the fact that we produce enough food. We also have 650 million people obese globally and 255 million with shortened lifespans because of an inappropriate diet. So my concern is more um, there's less about yields and more about what we produce on our farmland. So um, one study in 2000, this was 2008, but I think it was actually 2018, apologies. <laughs> um, it was a modeling study which indicated that Europe could actually reduce the amount of agricultural land it uses and become self-sufficient while actually um, engaging in, in organic approaches um, if we oriented our land in Europe towards healthy diets, so less meat and dairy and more fruit and veg. Um, the there's a study of the Dutch diet which indicated that discretionary drinks, and it only considered wine, beer, tea and coffee, they account for 12% of the land use of um, the that's used for feeding the, the people in, in Holland. And that doesn't include sugar, refined flours, or ultra processed foods. Um, and these are quite significant. In the UK, um, households get up to 50% of their dietary energy from ultra processed foods. Uh, and we also have a significant amount of land used for biofuels. So at the moment, we're not orienting our farmland towards um, towards feeding ourselves very well. And my definition of agroecological food systems is that um, the food production is ecologically regenerative and it provides healthy food for the human population on an equitable basis. So that's what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the transition of food systems in Scotland um, from pre-capitalism to today. So <laughs> on to the Highlands then. Um, in the clanship highlands, uh, land was held for the good of the clan um, by the clan chiefs and elites, and it was organized by a township. And um, people had plots of land uh, as individuals, as, as households, and those plots were rotated between people every few years so that no one had a better or a worse plot. Um, arable agriculture was prioritized over grazing. There was, there was both, but the priority was to ensure that arable production continued and and was sufficient and production overall was based on sufficiency and there weren't any incentives for maximization and that's partly because it was a militarized society where um it was it was probably easier to go steal another clan's food <laughs> and also there was a risk of um uh, you know a, someone from from another clan stealing stealing your food if you had a surplus. Um, but in general, the, 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 the focus wasn't on maximization, it was on ensuring that everyone had enough. Um, the landscape was a mosaic and um, it can generally be described as being divided between infields, outfields and, and shielding sites. So the infields had areas of cultivation with strips of pasture in between, and this is called the run rig system. And the top photo you can see the, the remains of, of this um, today. Um, there was also woodland where um, livestock was held uh, in, in the winter months and they grazed the undergrowth. There was also um, 
areas of scrub in the infields. In the outfields, there was semi-permanent grassland and heathland, um, but there was also areas of cultivation. And so people would engage in a practice called tathing, where they would um, round up their livestock into one area and have them graze that quite intensively and then move them on. And then that area that had been grazed was really suitable for cultivation because it had been trampled and, and manured already. Um, there were also shealing sites where people went for uh, more of the summer months that had heathland, scrub, also montane woodland. And they also, there's also evidence of that being cultivated as well. So there's basically, it's not a simple gradual transition from submontane to montane. There, was, there were these pockets of habitat throughout. Um, in terms of what people ate, there was quite a diverse diet. Um, the grains were barley and oats primarily. People had a, a good amount of dairy. Uh, they had meat from goats and, and some sheep and cows. They had fresh water, fish and, and seafood, and um, uh, salt water, fish and seafood. They um, hunted fowl, collected mushrooms, seaweed was part of the diet. Um, and then a lot of things that we would consider today to be weeds were actually part, um, could actually be considered staples. So silverweed roots, um, were dried and ground to make flour and this was considered, silverweed was considered the seventh bread of the gales. Um, and, and a whole host of, of berries and, and, and herbs as well. So the diet was, was quite diverse. In terms of yields, there was a general belief in the 18th century that the clanship agriculture, and um, obviously from people who were outside of it, um, was backwards, unproductive and that clansmen Clansmen were indolent. Um, and, and some of this is based on, on um, rent and trade records, but those would have underestimated yields and consumption because many of the foods that people consumed weren't used as rent. Um, there were also biases about what was productive. Again, this idea that, um, <laughs> that weeds were used to buffer crop losses wasn't understood by people coming in and, and seeing um, clanship agriculture. So they'd often there's there's an account of seeing that oh you know their their fields were so weedy, whereas actually that might have been considered a, a really good thing. Um, in terms of some of the records, they indicate that yield averages for grain are similar to that of the lowlands. Um, there's also indications that the areas under cultivation were comparable to um, areas in the lowlands. So, so basically that there was a similar amount of arable agriculture for um, similar sized townships in both the, the highlands and the lowlands. Um, the 1690s famine, which, um, which spread across Europe as part of the Little Ice Age, um, that was assumed to hit the highlands really hard, but that was based on not um, not evidence in the highlands per se, but on the dearth that happened in the southern uplands. But the southern uplands had different property relations. And the studies that do exist about um, the effects of, of the 1690s um, Middle Ice Age on the highlands indicate that glut was a complaint rather than dearth. And the township system and the system of um, distributing food um, amongst the clansmen actually helped protect people in the highlands from dearth. Um, overall, I would say that the clanship system had an agroecological food system. So people maintained for soil fertility and engaged in nutrient and energy cycling through adding seaweed, thatch, manure and bedding to, their, um, to the areas that they cultivated. They maintained high levels of diversity. So I've talked about the agricultural diversity. The non-agricultural diversity is evidence in those mosaics of landscapes between heathland and woodland and shrub, uh, scrub and, and grassland. And there were rotations, as I've talked about, um, and integ uh, integration of animals and crops. Um, again, that tathing, people graze their animals between crop rows. Um, there was you know, migration between um, seasonal migration between shealing sites and, and infields. Um, and the production was overall oriented towards societal use value. Now, for a variety of reason, reasons, clanship begins to decline um, in the 17th and 18th century. And there are a variety of complex factors involved here. And I'm not an expert in this. And there's quite a lot of scholarship and debate about it. 
Um, so some of the factors were imperialism, um, racial and ethnic discrimination, uh, backlash from the Jacobite rebellion, and also the general movement of um, the improvements and influence by Adam Smith and ideas of efficiency. What I'm interested in is, is what happened as a result of that. So there was a dramatic change to social property relations where clan chiefs and elites become, instead of stewards of the land, they become landowners, landlords from the middle of the 18th century onwards. Um, and land tenure, instead of being allocated to ensure everyone had enough to produce for their, their household and a, a little bit of surplus for, for non-agricultural households, um, it ends up being allocated based on um, who can pay the highest rent. And so land becomes oriented towards exchange value instead of use value. Um, and what we see is that this happened around the time of um, high demand and high prices for wool. And so the majority of land and the best quality land ended up becoming dedicated to sheep. Um, and in this process of, of sheep cultivation, um, the, the land that used to be used for arable agriculture and the land that was for woodland and scrub ends up being replaced over time with with heathland and with grassland um, and then that over time gets um, replaced with bracken and, and mosses and um, so we have a, a kind of ecological succession happening and a lot of those mosaic landscapes and um, the clansmen who had occupied the land become cleared um, or removed forcibly to the margins of estates um, onto what became known as crofts. So um, crofts were intentionally designed by the improvers to be so small so as to require people to work 200 days of the year selling their labour in order to um, meet their subsistence needs. And conveniently, they had to work in the landlord's fishing and kelping industries. Um, and in this context, potatoes become really widespread because you can you can grow more calories per acre of potatoes than you can with grains. Um, immigration at the time was discouraged and became, became expensive. Again, that was in the landlord's interest to have, to have the availability of labour for these other industries. And in this situation, everyone is dependent on markets. So the landlords are dependent on um, the tenants paying them rent. The tenants are dependent on selling enough sheep uh, in order to pay their rent. And the laborers are dependent on um, both selling their labor and being able to buy food in markets. Um, obviously, this doesn't uh, go very well. So the potato blight spread, spreads across Europe and hits Highland Scotland in 1830s and very badly in 1846, um, uh, resulting in very severe poverty, famine and disease. Um, in this context of people not being able to work or, or pay rent, immigration becomes encouraged and at times forced. And crucially, the highlands become perceived as overpopulated and the land is perceived as incapable of supporting the population through agriculture. Um, and this is despite the fact that the majority of land is still used for sheep farming during this time. So just to give you a sense of scale, just one estate, the Sutherland estate was 1.36 million acres. And um, that was dedicated, that's land that was dedicated solely to the rearing of sheep rather than the provision of people's um, basic food needs. And when the clearances happened, they were often justified in terms of freeing up more land for the people to live on, but they actually only freed up more land for the extension of, of sheep walks of, of these estates. So in terms of agroecological food systems, I've put on the left the main principles of, of agroecology as I've described them before. Um, in terms of the capitalist food system, instead of nutrient and energy cycling on farms, we see nutrients sent outside of the area in, embodied in, in the sheep um, and what could be considered a metabolic rift. Um, instead of soil, enhancing soil organic matter and biological activity, we see uh, high, high levels of soil degradation and erosion to the extent that bare, bare rock is exposed and also the loss of soil building activities. So 
with clansmen moved off of the estates, they're not there to, to tend to the land. But also even on the crofts, it's difficult because seaweed is commoditized, so they can't apply it to their fields as well. Um, instead of diversifying plant species, we see a dr drastic reduction um, in agricultural diversity. So, you know, that slide I showed with all the different foods gets sort of reduced to just sheep, which isn't even consumed. Um, and potatoes. And as I said, we get a, a loss of a lot of those um, ecological mosaics and a uniformity in the landscape. Um, instead of interactions um, within the farming system, there's a disintegration of animal and crop systems. The, um, again, many crofters still produce potatoes. But in general, the arable production got shifted to, to the lowland areas and, and other areas of Britain uh, and abroad. And then instead of production being oriented towards human needs, it's based on exchange value. Um, and there's also fewer social and biophysical resources available for food production. So there's less land available. Um, land that people used for hunting and foraging becomes enclosed and, and that's no longer um, accessible and also that people because they're working 200 days a year at least and um, they don't have that time to to forage and hunt and and collect food like they used to um, so in terms of what this tells us about the agrarian potential of the uplands um, the change in social property relation property rights affected the agrarian capacity of the highlands to sustain its population um, the over-specialization and intensification of sheep and potato farming were specific to the privatization and individualization of land. And I think that if, um, if property rights hadn't changed uh, and wool prices still had shot up, I don't think we would have seen the same changes to land use that we saw in the highlands. Um, the division of uplands and lowlands was based more on comparative advantage of mechanization rather than the uplands being unsuitable for cultivation. So in both situations, I haven't really touched on this because um, I'm trying to really hone in my, my slides, but um, <laughs> it, both um, the sheep farming and um, mechanized arable farming are based on minimizing labor costs. Um, and because you couldn't really do large scale mechanized arable farming in the uplands because of its uh, geographical features, that became a lowland activity, whereas the uplands you could have the low labor requirement of, of livestock farming. Um, I, I would argue that the degradation of land because of the intensive sheep farming reinforced the perception that cultivation is impossible in the uplands. But there are many pockets of the uplands which could be cultivated and um, a great amount of scope for rebuilding soils rather than seeing soils as, as fixed entities. Um, so the Blackland Centre has been actually investigating uh, areas that that used to be cultivated and, and could still be cultivated today. Um, I would say that the perception of what's natural and ecologically possible can be skewed by social property relations. And um, I would say, yeah, if you want to know more about why sheep farming continued after this initial transition to capitalism, please do um, check out my full thesis, or perhaps I can do another presentation on that another time. Um, but it was essentially reinforced in the productivist era of the of the post-war um, post period, and uh, which, yeah, I'll talk about that another time. <laughs> In terms of what it means for food sovereignty and agroecology, um, my study empirically shows how capitalism, as defined as market dependence, pre prevents an agroecological food system from existing. And it in indicates that the agroecology movement needs to consider market dependency and can't simply be pro peasant or pro small scale, counter industrial or counter corporate. Um, and it also reinforces some of these counter capitalist aspects of the food sovereignty movement, such as decommodification of food challenging private property relations and trade reform. Um, I would go further than democratizing trade and say that I think trade policies need to consider explicitly the social and environmental impacts on trade, um, both in the importing and exporting countries. <laughs>
And I just want to clarify, because this has come up in the past when I've talked about this research, that this is not a call to return to the past. It's not a call to return to clanship or a glorification of clanship, but it's rather providing insights about capitalism um, and about ecological potentials so that we can create a future post-capitalist agroecological society. So my, my theory of change is that if more people understand capitalism and its dynamics and can debate and discuss it, because obviously there's many understandings of it, then collectively we as a society can start coming up with ideas of how we transition away from it and what that would look like. Um, so that's all that I'll share for today. And thank you very much. If you have questions, please send me an email and I look forward to taking as many questions as I can. Um, now in our time together.